Barr McClellan exposes the secret high-level conspiracy in Texas of uh, a state so corrupt it almost defies description that led to Kennedy's death and LBJ's succession as president. And welcome to the program, Barr. Well, glad to be with you. Thank you. Now, now you represented President Lyndon Johnson and his interests from 1966 through 1971. Uh, what kind of a guy was he? He was ruthless, um, unwilling to compromise. He had to have his way. Kind of like a, 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 a nasty, brutish child? Really nasty, brutish child, a juvenile delinquent when he was a kid anyway, and he never really outgrew it. It's funny how when you get started, it stays with you. Mm. Um, but he was mean. Now, it's not what you saw in public. He looked like a man willing to compromise, um, you know, give anything to get anything. But behind the scenes, and uh, he was mean, and that's what I can bring out. I can show you how he, uh, how, how he operated. We have uh, recently posted on my website again that very famous photo called the wink by some during the uh, swearing-in ceremony on Air Force One. You have the wink, huh? Yeah, we've got it. You, you're familiar with that. Yeah, I put it in my book, too, because it really is not that well-known, but it sure says a lot. Just a one wink and right there at the height of his being sworn in, he's got Jackie standing beside him, and she's still recovering. I mean, she's still in Oh, shock. she's utterly in grief. I mean, yeah, my God. grief. And the man turns over his right shoulder, and you can see, you can't see LBJ's face, but you can sure see the wrinkle marks on the side of his cheeks. He's, he's, he's smiling a bit. He's happy, and mm. Lady Bird is standing beside him, and she's grinning. And it was a very sad moment. It should have been a very sad moment, but he, for him, it was a very happy moment. Well, that's, that's who LBJ was. Now, this one time he blew his cover after the assassination, I uh, knew about it going in, and he was supposed to show that um, remorse that was appropriate for the occasion. And he lost that cover at that moment. Too much, too much of a high for him. He couldn't hold it down. Yes. Amazing. Was. Amazing. Um, okay, Barr, tell us tell us the story how uh, how you came to this decision to write the book, and uh, then we'll fill in some of the spaces. Sure, I had uh, gone on with uh, Ed Clark, who was the power broker, the boss of Texas, uh, uh -huh. all during the forties, fifties, into the sixties. Joined his law firm in nineteen sixty six, and started hearing rumors to the effect that uh, Clark had been behind the assassination. Right away. Uh, right away. I mean, that first year. And I really didn't believe him. It just, you know, couldn't be. In 1973, I was partner and working with Don Thomas, who was the other key partner in the firm and was business attorney for uh, Johnson. Well, you climbed the ladder fast. Well, and I, I was doing pretty good. Uh -huh. I did have a couple of real good cases and uh -huh. I made them some money. That's the kind of thing you look at, of course. They liked them. And did some did some things for Johnson off and on. It was our pro bono work. We um, we, oh. <laughs> we helped the president however we could, oh. uh, stopping parades, um, supporting elections, um, just doing whatever it took to to make sure Austin, Texas, stayed with him. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I found out about it for sure from Don Thomas. Um, learned even more when we did a um, uh, a cover for him on getting some psychiatric work after the uh, he came home from the. Uh, White House in 1969. He went into deep uh, psychiatric um, treatment. For very depressed, um, paranoia really brought it on. It was a paranoia that developed shortly after the assassination and uh, was noted by some of John Kennedy's men who stayed in the White House for a while. Um, my, my quick explanation for it is he knew he could kill to become president, and he was worried someone else might. But it stayed with him. We worked on that. Plus, Ed Clark, uh, again, who was the boss of Texas, asked me to help him get a bonus, a uh, bonus well. It was some high-level negotiating that was going on for him to get a bonus for the assassination. I didn't realize it at the time. It only came apparent to me uh, several years later. This is after he left the White House. He, yes. Uh, Johnson had come home. Mm -hmm. Clark had figured he would be in for eight years. Yeah, he decided not to run, for those of you who don't know. He announced he would not be a candidate again. And was it, was this just as a side uh, bar stemming from that paranoia, do you think? Did that put him over the edge? Or was it he really told not to run again? Well, the whole thing put him over the edge. The paranoia just extended to everything. He was mm -hmm. afraid of the military. Mm -hmm. He was afraid of the media. He was afraid of, of everything. Mm -hmm. 
and he really became non-functioning uh, even while he was in the White House. And really, I can say that that all combined mm -hmm. to lead him out. He was a broken man when he came when he came back to Austin in 1969. Wow! So I'm picking up all this while I'm working with him, and um, I really come to believe it. I guess about the time I leave the firm, they asked me to do something that I just flat refused to do. We well, want to talk about that. Oh, it was fine. They wanted me to represent a client where I'd been representing clients on the opposite side okay. um, all across the state, and I told them I couldn't accept that conflict. They brought it to me three times, and I flat said no. Uh -huh. That's when they go in and ask Clark what to do, and he says, well, if Jaworski wants it, we give him anything he wants, which was another tie-in to the cover-up of the uh -huh. assassination I later found out. Hmm. And I thought, though, this was all covered by the attorney-client privilege. That privilege is very broad. It says that an attorney can't tell anything about what his clients uh, know unless necessary to prevent immediate injury. So it's very broad. Yeah. And I figured I had to live by it. But I got into litigation with my partners after I left, my former partners. And in 1984, knowing they were taking the system and just working it every way they could against me, I just flat put, a, put what I knew in, in an affidavit. Of course, it was filed with the DA and a bunch of judges across the state, but nothing was done then because Clark had control of the Texas justice system, what we call Bubba Justice. He had started this back in the late 1940s when he put a judge on the bench with the agreement with the judge that the judge would rule for Clark in any close case. And, of course, any case can be a close case. The judge would also agree to take any call from, from Clark when he wanted to talk to him. and. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, limited a judge's freedom a good bit too. <laughs> in return, he got payments. He could win at poker. He could his children would be taken care of. His friends would be taken care of. It was a very nice arrangement. It worked very well. It worked throughout the state because it was in Austin, and all your litigation involving state matters went through the state capital. All of so he, it. He all had it a just stranglehold on the state. Amazing. It really was, and a lot of people just can't believe it, but it's Bubba Justice at its worst. Well, you stuck your neck out by filing that affidavit. You you were brave. Some people would say maybe silly, but you were brave to do that. Well, I had all I could from those guys. I knew what they were doing. I'd seen how it was done. I said, that's it. No more. Let's go, fellas. We'll fight out in the open now. Wow. Finally, it took it took until 1994. It was 13 years of litigating, and everything went out. His bank failed. The one I was fighting primarily, the FDIC, took over, and there was nothing else to do. So, in 1992, I was talking to an agent, and he asked me if I had anything controversial, and I suggested this book, and he, of course, bought it immediately. We um, went to work getting the research done because I had left everything when I left the law firm. And had to get the exhibits together and all that took it took five years. How hard was that? It was hard because getting information from the government is next to impossible. Especially uh, a government like that. Oh yeah, they knew what uh, what was involved here. A lot of it came out of the Kennedy archives, and it just took time and like pulling hen's teeth. Anyway, we had the whole case together, and I had to let the Kennedy family know. And after that, we started on the book itself. It took five more years to go through the writing, the editing, the re-editing, the fact-checking. So you notified the Kennedy family. The one question that, that I've pondered over the years, as have many, many millions of others, is w at what point did the Kennedy family realize that, that, that LBJ was involved? Do you have any, any read on that? I do. There are a couple that have, uh, over the years, the first one really came through Jackie Kennedy, she commissioned a book through France by James Hepburn, um, Farewell America, and it pretty well concluded there was a conspiracy involving big oil. I say pretty well because she couldn't be sure. They just didn't have access to the kind of evidence that I, I could bring out. Right. More recently, um, again, we're back dealing with the real world and real people. We did get a call from a nephew uh, of Kennedy's uh, saying that what's in the book about uh, – the events in Dealey Plaza at the power at the Parkland Hospital and then at the airport at the airplane Air Force One are accurate. So it's really the first breakthrough I know uh, for the Kennedy family uh, coming through. Mm -hmm. They've been real quiet about it. Um, of course, it was a massive tragedy for them. There's just no explaining the the, the horror, the the, no. the the loss that Bobby Kennedy, for example, suffered. The big question is why didn't he do more? Um, he was hamstrung. J. Edgar Hoover, who just happened to be a neighbor of Lyndon Johnson's, uh, cut off any communication, even though 
Bobby Kennedy then was Attorney General. And he, Kennedy Bobby was supposed to reveal everything once he gained the presidency. He made that announcement while he was campaigning, and of course he was he too was killed. That cost him. Yeah, that cost him. Mm -hmm. But um, the family has really suffered so much, and if if they could somehow get some peace of mind on this, it would um, it would yeah. be good. It well, be I good. think your book goes a long way to, to helping that happen. The the uh, the murder of John Kennedy Jr. And uh, that's how we refer to that around here. Uh, came as a, a shock to the nation, but I was surprised at how quickly that that seemed to have been filed away by most people. I, th how do you see that plane crash? I really, Jeff, couldn't say anything about that. Not, not um, in the sense that I, I I can say anything definitive about it. I just mm -hmm. don't know enough. Does it? It bothers you. The oh, circumstances. It no, yeah. it does. It does. The, 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 the Robert Kennedy uh, murder is a real. The murder of John Kennedy Jr., and uh, that's how we refer to that around here, uh, came as a, a shock to the nation. But I was surprised at how quickly that, that seemed to have been filed away by most people. I, the, how do you see that plane crash? I really, Jeff, couldn't say anything about that. Not, not, um, in the sense that I, I I can say anything definitive about it, I just mm -hmm. don't know enough. Does it it bothers you the oh, circumstances? It no, yeah. it does. It does. Yeah. The, 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 the Robert Kennedy uh, murder is mm -hmm. a real a uh, real problem. A real problem. It sure is. Uh, anybody who studies that objectively and honestly, I uh, can't help but come away with uh, <laughs> a lot of concern. Well, it's one tradition that ran with uh, Lyndon Johnson. He was one of the few presidents that had the record he had of uh, people dying while he was in office, and uh, not just president, but Senate, House. Uh, he left. He left a trail. So he had a death list too. Oh, he had a death list, and two of them are in the book because they are well established. I was really reluctant to bring in too many what 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 people would consider rumors. I wanted to be able to show what had happened, but there were two murders, and they're in the book. Uh, that are well documented. Uh, the first one was right after he was elected to the Senate. Uh, you probably heard about the 1948 election where he stole the election. Mm -hmm. I was able, through my partner Don Thomas, uh, to tell what happened there. And Don Thomas was the man, the missing man, that was down in this little town in South Texas uh, stuffing the ballot box uh, <laughs> with dead people, the names of dead people. Yeah. Anyway, I brought Lyndon in, and that uh, raised a real scandal. Everybody knew what had happened, and everybody in the state was getting ready to run against him. So right after that, he couldn't have any scandal come up. But one developed because his sister, Josepha, got involved in a sex circle in Austin, Texas. She was running around with this fellow named Doug Kinzer, and um, he was trying to get money from the government. Lyndon Johnson was just starting the uh, SBA then. Mm -hmm. It could have been a real problem for Johnson and Clark, uh, working with Mac Wallace, who was uh, married to another woman involved in this circle, was called upon to kill Doug Kinzer. He did. He walked into his office at a little pitch-and-putt golf course there in Austin, shot him four times, killed him. Didn't flee, really. He, he, he kind of lingered around. He had to be arrested because if the murder was unsolved, there'd be too much digging going on. Got it. Anyway, he's tried. Uh, the jury recommends either, well, they split. Now, they want to give him the death penalty or a life sentence. One of Clark's bought judges, though, takes the case over and gives him a five-year sentence and then suspends it. So Wallace walks out. <laughs> oh. uh, that was the first oh. that we know. And yeah. Again, ten years later, June 3, 1961, Wallace shoots uh, and kills Henry Marshall. Well, that one in the Texas judicial system gets ruled a suicide. But uh, 12 years later, with a Texas Ranger after the case, just keeping after him, that that. That uh, grand jury verdict has changed to murder, mm -hmm. and the indictment says that we can't indict the people because they're dead, but they would have been Lyndon Johnson, Mac Wallace, and um, uh, Cliff Carter, uh, wow. a close friend. Yeah. So you, you had it there. You have this man uh, with a trail of murders that's documented. There are rumors about more, but like I said, I tried to keep the book really focused, corroborated right. evidence, and... Um, carried on up to the assassination itself. Well, you, you, I've just got my copy today and wasn't able to read much of it, but uh, what I did read was the documentation is stunning. I mean, it's all there. It really is. I tried to do that with the key documents so that you don't even have to believe a word I'm telling you. You can look at these documents 
And what we were able to do was make a fingerprint match to this Mac Wallace who killed these other two men. Oh, you got the fingerprints in the book. I saw that. The fingerprints are there. They put his fingerprints on the sniper's nest on the sixth floor there in Dallas. So we made our case. We had, I'd say, 68 total exhibits in the book, but that one nails it down. All right, we'll come back and uh, we'll pause for a couple minutes and we'll talk about that fingerprint and how that does lock it up. What a What a corrupt and horrible state government system. And it, it again, one wonders if it's changed any. And that death list issue, we saw the uh, Clinton death list, and now there's a talk about a, a Bush death list, and it, it seems that suicides and accidents have become a kind of a, a new means of taking care of business in this country, maybe more so than ever. Blood, money, and power, how LBJ killed JFK. Let's talk about... The mechanics of the uh, the murder, the assassination of our president, and uh, the fingerprint, and then we'll talk about uh, maybe some of the main tentacles connected to the operation, big oil, and some people talk about the Rothschilds, the money. Uh, some people talk about Cuba and Castro, and there are a lot of rumors around. But uh, let's see how you read that. But first, the mechanics of the actual assassination. Yeah, you know, the actual assassination pretty well played out with the um, crime scene itself. Um, what I was able to do was fit the key players that we knew were involved. Mac Wallace on the sixth floor with Lee Harvey Oswald. With him? With him. Oswald was a patsy, just like he said he was. And Wallace was there because that fingerprint identification places him on that same floor. We know there was another man on the sixth floor. Uh, he fired one of the shots. There also was a man over on the grassy knoll, and this um, is evidence that came out by the House Special Committee that investigated the assassination uh, after the Warren Commission concluded there was a conspiracy and that there was a shooter on the, on the grassy knoll. We have not been able to identify that person with the kind of certainty that we have with Mike Wallace putting him on the sixth floor, but he was there and he fired, fired the uh, fatal shot. Where we pin this all down is how did they get away? And we know Oswald got down from the sixth floor to the second floor. Wallace went down first, and he had a, con a helper there um, who was dressed as in, in suited in a suit, and they um, got together and were out the back door uh, of the of the uh, depository where a police officer stopped them. And they told him they were Secret Service, and that meant no further questions from the police officer. He went on. Those two men uh, were the assassin, Mac Wallace, and uh, his cover, who was there to, to protect him while he was on the sixth floor. What was Oswald doing? He was. Uh, he realized what had happened right after the shooting. Wallace had already taken off. He knew he had to get away during that initial shock. And Oswald saw what had happened. He tried to get away, too. He knew he'd been had and uh, didn't huh. make it. Ultimately, you know, during, later during the day, he gets caught. He Do we goes, think that he saw the actual shooting? He okay. was right there? Okay. He was there. All right. And, uh, and you think the fatal, excuse me, Barbara, you think the fatal shot, the head shot, did come from the book depository? No, it came from the, uh, the front. From the, uh, from the grassy knoll. Actually, there's a stockade fence that extends there towards the triple underpass, and that's where this fellow we've called Junior was located. Okay, so and, yeah, obviously, I mean, you look at the Zapruder film, and these people still talk about he was shot from the book depository and his, his head went the wrong direction. They try to ballistically prove that feasible, and it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, the no, shot, the it, fatal shot came from the front. It came from the front, and um, everybody that looks at it knows that. The American people, 80% of us know there was a conspiracy, and sure. we know the shot came from the front. But what they did, they found another Secret Service guy back over behind the pergola right after the shooting. A police officer stopped. The guy says, I'm Secret Service. That was Junior, this fellow we have not uh, named yet. We, we have our suspects, but we don't have the proof to put him there. Lansdale involved? Uh, who? Uh, a guy named Lansdale? No, military. We uh, well, we haven't ruled out anyone yet, but okay. we're really looking at three right. others. You think you got it pretty close, though? We got it real close, okay. and, and the interesting thing is a couple of them are still around. So it's, it's not like everybody's gotten off scot-free. Okay, so the shot from the book depository did go through the neck. That was from the neck. The and, upper back, yeah. And a, an entirely separate shot hit Connolly. 
So this business of one magic bullet uh, going through all that flesh and blood and, and coming out in... Oh, it's ridiculous. Perfect. Forget so, it. Okay, now uh, we got two shots from the book depository. One hits JFK, one hits Connolly. Right, and the third one there from the front there okay. apparently was a fourth shot. We can't rule that out yet. Uh, this really ties to Oswald's uh, rifle where there were three um, empty shells found by the sniper's nest. Mm -hmm. We can account for those as a miss, and there seems to be pretty good agreement that the first shot was a miss. He got excited. He fired too soon. Uh, the plan didn't go off perfectly. They had to be. They had to have the cover-up, and, of course, the other part of the plan that didn't work, Oswald was supposed to die in a blaze of glory. Instead, he gets away, and he has to be, um, he, to be killed, and that's where Ruby steps in. Amazing thing is following Oswald after he gets away, he didn't take his pistol with him. So he went back to the boarding house to get it. As soon as he sees a police officer, he shoots him. That's Officer Tippett. They chase him to the Texas theater where he's arrested, trying to shoot it out again. Right. And they've got their they got their suspect. Of course, he says he's a patsy. He realizes what had happened. He was a patsy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say he wasn't even there. But if he wasn't there, it's an easy thing to say something else. I'm innocent. Instead, he says he's a patsy, which halfway, you know, putting him there already. Yeah, it does. All right, the, um, again, the name, just for the record, in case anybody missed that, the name of the man who shot from the book depository. Mac Wallace. Same guy we talked about earlier. And we, and we got a fingerprint. And tell us about the fingerprint. We got the fingerprint. This was uh, when I started my research. I knew Clark and Johnson were involved in it. I just had to find the proof. And I figured, well, maybe the, wall, the Warren Commission overlooked something. I found the fingerprints. They overlooked about 26 prints. And we took those prints, got the print card from Mac Wallace when he murdered Doug Kinzer, mm -hmm. and asked this, this really noted uh, uh, latent print examiner, uh, Nathan Darby. He had helped the Philippines set up their system. He'd helped Kodak develop its fingerprint identification system. He was a top-notch expert. We gave it to him blind because people get so emotional about this assassination, they, 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 they can't see straight. Gave it to him blind. He made the match. Then we told him what was involved, and it didn't stop him. He stood by his guns, uh, gave us uh, the affidavit, and that's when we got hold of the Kennedy family, let them know what was going on, and took what we had to the authorities, Dallas Police Department and the Assassination Records Review Board. Uh, this was in uh, May of 1998. All right. Uh, a lot of questions, but real quickly. So Wallace murders Kinzer, walks into the miniature golf course, blows him away, stands around, gets arrested, gets off with a five-year suspended sentence, goes on to murder the uh, murder. He shot JFK, not the fatal shot, but he certainly shot him, shot Governor Conley, sets Harvey uh, Lee Harvey Oswald up. Uh, what a story. And you well, got the fingerprints to prove it. And we got the prints to put the icing on the cake. We got well, a lot of other written documents. Yeah, I'm sure, well, the book is just loaded, as I say. Warren, in a word or two, the Warren Commission, incompetent or set up from the beginning to whitewash? It was pretty well set up from the beginning to whitewash. I don't know so much intentionally as they just were going to make sure nothing went further than Lee Harvey Oswald. They were almost afraid to go any further. I would think. All right. Well, I know how cheap life can be when you push the wrong buttons well, when you got power the tentacles of power that came together to orchestrate this it wasn't just uh, a single level i'm sure there was much more to it but uh, let's let's hear it from you sure it was uh, and it was multi-level the problem really arose for johnson in 1961 with the henry marshall murder uh, it was really plotted during the inaugural week so kennedy's being inaugurated he's got a real problem and he calls on ed clark to help him he gives clark the uh, Secret Service manual for the protection of the president to see the game plan. Clark is the one who enlists support. It's a very subtle thing, but he wants people to know that some big changes are going to be made, and he needs to know that they'll be okay if Kennedy's gone. Uh, this includes some people with big oil, some people with uh, heavy-duty construction, some people with big interests in the military-industrial uh, complex. Mm -hmm. And um, he's got his team together, but he, he knows he can't. I mean, and he's not going to tell everybody what's going on. He keeps the conspirators, the crime, Henry uh, the Mac Wallace uh, group, very quiet. They're very small. But um, he does have this support that he knows he's going to have after the assassination, which becomes critical. He's got to have a perfect, uh, you know, a perfect cover for this. Mm -hmm. 
I mentioned the plan didn't go uh, perfectly. Uh, Oswald is still hanging around. He's got to be dead. So Murkison is brought in, uh, Clinton Murkison, the uh, mm-hmm. the uh, multimillionaire in Texas who becomes a billionaire during the 60s. And he um, brings uh, organized crime there in the Dallas area into the scene, probably through what's known as the Red Man's Club in in Dallas. And they get Ruby to do the job, and he does. Did they? How did they get? Did they order simply tell Ruby you're going to do this, or did they they pay him off? How did they get that to happen? Well, it was one of those mixes of things where Ruby owed him something. Uh, Ruby uh-huh. wanted to help out. Uh, it was a mix, and uh-huh. it worked. Um, he was one of several, but he was the one that did the job. And of course, they take a lie detector test. This is just the incredible thing how this cover up works. But Earl Warren himself sits there and watches. Uh, during the, the polygraph exam, uh, it comes out that uh, Ruby is lying, and everybody says he's okay. <laughs> he dies not long after. A cancer uh, accidental or more to it than that? A very quick-acting cancer. It very was. strange, but covered up. Okay. Of course, the key to it was uh, his lawyer was Joe Tonahill, who just happened to be a real close friend of Ed Clark's and was named in there to keep keep the lid on Ruby. And we have a letter in there from Leon Jaworski mm-hmm. with notes on it by Ed Clark telling jo- telling Tonahill to keep Ruby quiet. Well, he does. So the cover-up, I mean, it extends here all this mm-hmm. time. You asked about the Warren Commission, you know, mm-hmm. were they in there to cover up? They were. And you, you see that in several ways, too. So this, this assassination, particularly once it's happened, everyone unites behind Johnson, who's responsible for it, and... They bound to have suspicions. I mean, in any criminal investigation, you look at the man with, the, with who gained the most. You know, who had the biggest motive. And it was Johnson, and uh, J. Edgar Hoover comes in and assures them all that there was just one shooter. I, I mean, it, it's almost complete. The Warren Commission itself. The, 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 one of the members comes in and says, "We're not a banana republic." Well, they didn't want to think, you know, that the, the military or somebody would go in and knock off the president to take over like a banana republic would, but who even suggested we were? I mean, who mm-hmm. needed to deny something that mm-hmm. nobody, it, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty funny. People it, don't it just, people it, don't think, though. They don't watch the progression of things like that, and they can't look behind. They, they just don't get it. They just... They don't. Watching the front it, hand while the back hand is, is robbing them blind. It, it is, and it's just power at its worst, and how you can take it and abuse it and get away with, well... With assassination. Impunity. Uh, coup d'etat for the military-industrial complex, is that an overstatement? Uh, that would be because it really came down to Johnson, but it involved all these people. Mm-hmm. So you can't say the military-industrial complex wasn't involved, and they were certainly mm-hmm. supportive once it was over. And the mob uh, and everybody. Uh, yes, they all came together. Multiple reasons, I guess, really. There were a number of reasons to, to remove John Kennedy, not just one or two. There were a lot of aggrieved parties out there. That's they were, they were a lot. They were, and, and and I hate to say this, but they were glad to see him gone. They helped in the cover up for sure. So it did have tentacles. It reached way out, and it really became apparent during the uh, during the period after the assassination. I mean, it started at Parkland Hospital, and just kept on going. The body uh, altered. Uh, we, we pretty well know that. It's pretty well. I can't say for sure. I really yeah. haven't looked into it, but my experts that I worked with are, are convinced that there was some mm-hmm. altering and probably a second body. Uh, some of that is just amazing how they tried to raise that uh, shot from from behind, yeah. move it up on his back. But I mean, <laughs> good try. Can't do that. No, no, physics gets in the way. Uh, just extraordinary. The uh, the aftermath of all this is that no one was really brought to justice. It was almost a perfect crime, and I guess to this day, there most of those people are dead and gone. Uh, Nellie Conley had some interesting remarks uh, a week or two ago. We had those. I'm sure you saw those as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, it is amazing, and um, it was almost a perfect crime. Uh, I think the, the, the what made it not so perfect was the American people as a as a, as, a, as a whole really saw through the whole scene in, in Dallas that day. They knew it was not. Uh, you know, a lone nut. And I hope that what I can bring out will really blow that lid completely. Can we uh, can we retire the uh, the Fidel Castro uh, Florida mob uh, angle or is that still a small tendril in this thing? 
no, I don't see it as being a part, except that the military-industrial complex had every reason to support uh, the assa- support uh, the assassination. Mm-hmm. And I, again, like I say, per- particularly after the fact. Well, look, look at the Vietnam ramp up and uh, the money made there and so forth. And oh yeah, it fit right in with Johnson. Of course, Johnson uh, becomes so paranoid that uh, he's afraid of everything, and it becomes easy to convince a paranoid guy to to go to war. Who was running him? him? Who who's directly running the guy? Uh, well, there would have been several, really. I mean, he had a number that he relied on, but when it really came down to it, mm-hmm. it was Ed Clark. Ed Still Clark Ed Clark. Was, Ed Clark was the man. He, he wrote a letter so, saying, I am not indebted to anyone else more than you, and I hold no one in higher esteem. No. The only man he trusted. He was the only man he trusted. Wow. Uh, I think well, I always like to roll the tape backwards a little bit and, and remember Eisenhower's, uh, I guess it was one of his, maybe it was his final speech, wherein he warned America about this, this very mechanism. Indeed, he did, and um, uh, it, it makes it interesting from this standpoint. With Johnson, he worked real closely with Brown and Root, who were deep into the military-industrial complex, plus big oil. And, and a lot of people don't know this: big oil had so much money, uh, and they put it into the military-industrial complex there in the Dallas area. And you see this through investments in mm-hmm. uh, fighter fighter uh, air, aircraft there, oh, it's the FX. Well, the Johnson all. Space Center, NASA, every, you know, it's all there. It's all there. And it's it's in Texas most of it. All right, let's uh, now let's roll the tape uh, fast forward and uh, take the Bush family and overlay it on the on the corrupt Texas power structure. Well, let me in their defense, I've got to say this: that one reason Johnson and Clark could get away with murder in Texas was it was not a two party state. They ran it as a one party and really a very small party state. Ah. Did about what they wanted. George Bush was one of the first to really take a leadership with a, with a Republican Party in Texas. And, of course, he brought it to what it is today. Uh, it's a Republican state. So, is, it, is it as corrupt as it was under Clark? Oh, I don't think so at all. I think, and, and but there's some other reasons. The media has become a lot stronger, and um, I'd say two-party states there. It's a lot harder to, to get away with what, uh, what Clark could get away with. Hmm. So I give uh, I can't uh, fault the the Bush family for what they did in Texas to bring it out of the uh, the dark ages. Really, we still have uh, an awful lot of power in that state, huge amount of power, even if it's somewhat fragmented from what it used to be. I think it is, and especially on the national level, there is so much media coverage, and for all the uh, fuss and people do about the media, they really do a good job in keeping up with things and bringing it out. You know, as good a job as their masters will let them do. Now, we got to be honest here, and, and you know, Barr, as well as anybody, that uh, a few corporations run most of the media in this country. I know that, and uh, I found that out the way I put it as a writer. I have no rights. I'm subject to what my public <laughs> wants. I think we all have that problem. Who has the money, you know, calls sure. all the shots? Sure. But, yeah, that's right, and, and, they, it, and, and it's a serious problem. We have run into that in trying to get this book out to the American public. Yeah or some of the major media have turned us down. I'm surprised you did it. Um, I'm surprised they've turned us down, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think your comment is one that we need to keep in mind always, uh, dear listeners, when there is anything of a catastrophic or geopolitically substantial nature that happens suddenly, quickly, you have to immediately ask the question, who benefits the most? Exactly. And That's the key all the time. Follow the money comes right behind that. And that's one thing we do have in the book. We, for the first time, we've got the money trail in there, and uh, it is vital to the whole scheme. At some point in the future, do you expect uh, any of the Kennedy family to come forward? And uh, I don't mean endorse you or the book necessarily, but uh, speak publicly about this issue, which they are more than aware of. I would hope so. We are asking the Senate Judiciary Committee to request the Department of Justice and some of these other agencies that have withheld information Mm -hmm. to at least list what they have so that we can get it out. Um, There are so many records out there that we've got to have. Mm -hmm. and The Mm -hmm. push is on in the book, and it's going to be presented uh, in Washington next week to get this material out. We know it's there. We just have to see it, and I know it's going to show what I can tell you. It's, it's going to show Johnson was behind, and that's why it's so vital on the part of the government itself to keep it secret. I mean, these guys were all involved in it, and uh, they've got to be flushed out. I understand. Paper's going to do it. 
I uh, I am truly honored you've been here tonight. I salute you as a great American patriot, as a great human being, and uh, you're you're a hero, Bar McClellan. Thank you. No, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. All right, take care. Thank you.